Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a welcome to our latest edition of the Master Series effort. Uh, this is our very, very first effort when it comes to talking politics and economy. And uh, we are doing that with none other than Vivek Kaul. Uh, you've known Vivek for a few months now. He's been writing for the Daily Reckoning. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I want to rewind a bit. We first met Vivek probably in 2008, 7, 8, 9, uh, in those years. Uh, Vivek had written to us and said he wanted to come over and talk to Bill because he was a big fan of Bill Bonner. And that's how we met. And since then, we stayed in touch. And over the years, we knew we had to do something in the space of politics and economy, uh, largely because there's so much noise out there, but very little honest and transparent views going around. And uh, finally, in 2014, uh, you know, things got serious and uh, we finally decided to do something together. And uh, Vivek started off with writing The Daily Reckoning. So The Daily Reckoning, as you all know, has two editions. One written by Bill Bonner, who's the founder of Agora. And uh, Vivek writes, you know, two to three times a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, in terms of who Vivek is, I, you know, you all know him very well, but uh, he's been a columnist and writer for a very long time, been associated with Economic Times, DNA Money, what have you. Uh, but more recently, and I think more importantly, uh, Vivek just completed writing his trilogy of books uh, dealing with uh, money. And uh, that is uh, something I think no one's really done that uh, at the scale and scope that he's done in India over here. And uh, I must, you know, I, I need to admit I have not read the entire trilogy as yet, but it's there on my table and I plan to read it and I will share my feedback when I'm done with it. But, uh, but uh, you know, net net what I want to say is it's fantastic having, you know, Vivek as part of a team and uh, we look forward to doing great things with him. Uh, coming to what we're doing today, uh, you know, Modi has completed one year, is about to complete one year as Vivek corrected me a while back, uh, 26th of May, apparently. Uh, the day they take the probably oath is that's the day you count, not the day they win the election. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of noise around and the, there's a lot of uh, discussions around how Modi is done or not done. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is uh, one version of the media which is all gung-ho, you know, quoting Modi's ministers on how great they've done. Another version, of course, doesn't like anything which Modi does. And uh, we as investors uh, need to get a very good picture of what truly is happening because that is what ultimately goes into our decision making process. So today we are hope, you know, we're going to be talking to Vivek, uh, trying to understand that, uh, his take on, you know, Modi's first year, what it means to you, uh, what it should mean to you and what you should take away. Uh, so that will be the part one. Part two is, you know, we'll put forward, uh, put to Vivek some of the questions you all have sent. Uh, last count, you know, I was told there about 400 questions. I'm sure you all will appreciate we won't take them all up today in today's episode, but we'll do a few. And the part three, we will, you know, get Tanushri uh, to join us and then talk about the mega trends, which are so linked to what Modi is or is not doing in the Indian context. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, brief, uh, you know, introduction background, uh, Vivek, welcome to your first ever master series on Equity Master. Uh, thank you, Rahul. And, uh, uh, you know, thanks for having me over. So I should say that. So, you know, I basically uh, was talking to a friend of mine a couple of days back and uh, and I was telling him that uh, I'm doing this uh, one year Modi thing for Equity Master. And the first question he asked me was, uh, you know, how do you rate him on a scale of one to ten? Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, the question really tells us a lot about the times that we live in where everybody wants instant judgments, instant analysis. Uh, the problem is that, you know, a national government is not like a movie which releases every Friday, uh, which you can rate on a scale of one to five or say, you know, it, this I give this one three and a half stars, so you should go and watch the movie. So that kind of analysis, you know, uh, there's enough of it going around. And uh, I'll stay away from that. So at the end of uh, this uh, recording, uh, I will definitely not give a rating to the Modi government. <laughs> but I'll kind of uh, try and, uh, uh, you know, uh, cull out some points 
uh, which I feel are right and some yeah, things so. which I feel are wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, um, on Saturday, uh, every Saturday, there is a column in the Business Standard by T. N. Nainan, mm -hmm. who uh, is one of the greatest business editors in India. And in his column, uh, he kind of put forward a sort of an hypothetical question wherein he asks, you know, would another year of uh, Manmohan Singh, uh, you know, would you have wanted another year of Manmohan Singh government? And he put his uh, question, put this question to his friends and obviously the, the obvious answer was no. So to that extent, there is something that is right about uh, the Modi government. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't deny that. Uh, now, what are the good points that have happened over the last one year? Uh, one point which doesn't get uh, talked about often is the fact that uh, corruption at the top echelons, uh, at the top levels of the government has come down dramatically. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there is no direct way of measuring corruption. But from what one reads in the media and from what one hears from people who know about such things, uh, you get a feeling that corruption has come down. And if this kind of uh, lasts, then this would be very good for the country because the nexus between uh, politicians and uh, businessmen will break down in the years to come. Mm -hmm. the, the trouble is in the short run, uh, you know, the crony capitalists uh, which, you know, who infest this country will have to find out a new way of doing business. Mm -hmm. And till they get around to doing that, there will be some problem, some, you know, issues on the business front. That uh, being the case. The second point also which doesn't get uh, talked about often is the fact that inflation has come down dramatically. Uh, the inflation between uh, you know 2007 and 2013 averaged at around 10.2 percent and now uh, if you look at the latest inflation number, uh, the consumer price inflation number, it is less than 5 percent. So uh, obviously you know the credit for this uh, always tends to go to the Reserve Bank of India. But when you look at the fact that 50%, uh, in fact, as for the new series, 54% of uh, the consumer price index is uh, constituted by food products, you uh, you know you have to question whether RBI w was or is really responsible for bringing down inflation. So there are a couple of points where, uh, uh, in fact, there are three points where the government should get uh, credit for it. Uh, f the first thing is that, uh, you know, one of the first things uh, they did was as soon as uh, they came to power, they kind of decided to uh, sell stocks of food grains in into the open market. So that helped bring down the price of rice and wheat. The second point was uh, the minimum support price of wheat wasn't raised by a huge amount. It was raised by around 50 rupees per 100 kgs. And this went against the trend which prevailed uh, during the UPA government where the MSP minimum support price of both rice and wheat had been raised dramatically. So this helped contain inflation to some extent. And the third uh, important point was made by a gentleman called Ashok Gulati who uh, was a part of uh, or rather was the chairman of the Commission for Agriculture Costs and Prices which is a division of the Ministry of Agriculture in the last uh, government and he said that you know uh, when when the government came to power the f one of the things they did was they uh, decided to stop the export of onions mm -hmm. they decided to import onions and these onions were then kind of dumped into some of the most uh, important onion markets in the country in order to control the price of onion and they also went after people who hoarded onions. Mm -hmm. So these three points kind of tell us that you know the government had some role to play when it came to uh, controlling inflation. Then uh, the third important point that I wanted to make was about uh, the diesel price deregulation uh, or whatever has happened in the name of diesel price uh, deregulation. Uh, uh, you know, no, this has helped the government kind of uh, control the fiscal deficit uh, over the last uh, one year. The, the challenge here will be uh, in the days to come because now the price of petrol and diesel have started to go up again. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, the price of diesel in Mumbai, uh, where uh, you know when, when the Modi government came to power, diesel was around 65 rupees, now it's 59 per liter and uh, you know as when if and when we reach a situation when the price of diesel crosses 65 again then the real test of deregulation will come into play and some you know a recent statement by the oil minister Dharmendra Pradhan does not inspire 
does not kind of give you confidence on this front but then you know unless uh, you know uh, the price crosses uh, 65 we will not know uh the, the the fourth important was point that i wanted to make was the rail budget i mean i thought after many years uh, a railway minister kind of uh, talked about uh, reviving the infrastructure of the indian railways now this is something that should have happened many years back uh, given the lack of uh, you know physical infrastructure in this country and you know honestly it took a non politician railway minister to deliver uh, something on this front the interesting bit is if you read uh, the white paper which was released uh, along with the railway budget it's a very interesting uh, document and it's a very comprehensive document mm-hmm. which explains to you in extremely simple english as to how the government plans to go about building or rather reviving railway infrastructure in this country and uh, for that you know all credit uh, should go to suresh prabhu who is the railways minister the fifth point i wanted to make and this is again something which doesn't get talked about often is uh, how uh, you know f- i think for the very first time uh, someone has made an effort to explain economic reform to the citizens of this country now economic reforms in india have always been pushed through nobody is bothered to explain uh, those reforms to us now narendra modi has a program called uh, man ki baat on all india radio and in one of those programs he spoke on the land acquisition bill for uh, 30 minutes and i would suggest that if you still haven't heard it mm-hmm. just log on to the internet and hear him out and he explains you know he really dumps down the entire land acquisition bill in a very very simple way now you may not agree with what he is saying you may feel that he is giving a marketing spin to it and all that but you can't take away the fact from him that he has made a effort to explain his thinking mm-hmm. you may agree with it you may not agree with it that's a different thing and this has never happened before uh, in fact uh, just to add on to it arun jetli's speech in the rajya sabha trying to explain the land acquisition bill was also pretty good uh and i feel that you know if this is taken forward in the days to come it would uh, be a very interesting initiative obviously you can't expect the prime minister to kind of you know explain everything that he does but once in a while uh he can do it and otherwise you could obviously have some sort of an infrastructure around it and uh, this could be taken forward uh then there are uh, some of the smaller i mean some of the other points where uh, the government uh, completed the 2g and the coal auctions as uh, was instructed by mm-hmm. the uh, supreme court and you know the the coal auction at least uh, kind of uh, proved the entire zero loss theory that was offered by the leaders of uh, the congress led upa was basically bunkum and a lot of money has been raised through both these auctions now obviously you have to take uh, the money you know raised under the coal auctions with a pinch of salt because all this money is not going to come to the government up front it will come to a lot of uh, you know state governments over the year over the next 30 years but still you know some money mm-hmm. is coming in and that can't be uh, taken away then you had uh, the insurance bill which was pending for a while uh, that has been passed efforts are on to pass the goods and services tax uh, the the problem there is you know i mean from people who understand i mean i really don't understand gst that well as of now but people who understand gst uh, basically uh, are putting forward the opinion that it is a very uh, you know uh, what was the word uh, used it's a very compromised uh you know a, a bill in the sense that you know all the compromises that have built in have taken out the advantages of a you know a value added tax out so uh but then you know it's 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 happening and let's see how it goes the other important point uh, you know two important points i wanted to make uh, was one was regarding uh, make in india and uh, you know a lot of times it gets categorized as a marketing gimmick which it may very well be uh but what one needs to understand is the fact that no country in the world has gone from being developing to being developed without having a vibrant uh, manufacturing sector and in, in in india there is this you know strong belief that we don't need a manufacturing sector our services sector will pull us through which if you uh, look at economic history isn't really uh, correct so uh, make in india at least recognizes the fact that we need a vibrant ma- manufacturing sector 
the problem obviously is that you know it the government needs to get into some sort of detailing so perhaps a white paper or a vision document or something of that sort which actually tells us as to what do they mean by make in india i mean to tell us that it's not just a slogan it's something more than a slogan uh the the last point i wanted to make about uh, on the good part of uh, governance uh is regarding labor laws and uh, so labor laws have held back uh, you know the growth in size of many indian firms and uh, you know if if you kind of uh, f- you know follow people who write on such things the estimate is that the country has anywhere between 150 to 200 labor laws and there is no way you can run a business without breaking some labor law somewhere i mean you may you will not even know about the fact that you are breaking a law so in such an environment it becomes very difficult to carry on any business mm-hmm. so that needs to be corrected and uh, so uh, the governments of rajasthan and uh, uh, madhya pradesh where the bharatiya janata party is in power are working on this front Uh, other than that there was recently a news item in the indian express which talked about the fact that the government is looking to consolidate 44 central uh, labor laws into four codes which as and when it happens will be a good move uh, and you know uh, labor laws are very very important and we need to kind of move fast on this front because uh, you know indian firms are not being able to uh, grow big Uh, you know an excellent example here is the fact that bangladesh exports more textiles than india i mean which is very very ironical mm-hmm. i mean india is a country which is many times bigger than bangladesh is and the reason for that lies in the fact that an average bangladesh factory has around 350 to 400 workers whereas if you compare it to a factory in tirupur which is a textile hu- hub the average size is around 50 people so again i mean coming back to the point i had already made that labor laws are essentially hindering the growth of uh, indian firms and something uh, you know urgently needs to be done on this front so you know what also needs to be pointed out here is that 13 million indians are entering the workforce every year mm-hmm. and you need to create jobs for them mm-hmm. okay and then jobs was you know one of the major uh, talking points of narendra modi's campaigns mm-hmm. and unless you kind of have more you know if you reform these labor laws you know these jobs are never going to come through okay so uh, you know this was basically what i thought uh, with the good parts of the government and now i'll kind of want want, want to talk about one thing which i uh, i think you know on one thing on which the modi government was fairly lucky which is basically the price of oil you know a lot of again a lot of analysis attributes uh, the you know the the government uh, being able to uh, control the current account deficit as well as uh, the fiscal deficit and uh, but if you you know if you kind of look at the numbers the only reason or the major reason why the current account deficit as well as the fiscal deficit have come down uh, is because oil prices fell dramatically mm-hmm. in the last one year so on 26th may the the price of the indian basket for crude oil was 108 uh, dollars per barrel and by january it had fallen to around 43 dollars per barrel so obviously you know the indian oil companies were paying fewer dollars to import oil and once oil imports fell the current account deficit came down out automatically and uh, the second part of it is because the government was uh, paying the oil marketing companies for all the under recoveries uh, because of the fall fall in uh, the price of oil those under recoveries also came down yeah. so in in this case you know one has to understand the fact that uh, the modi government was very very lucky when it came to the price of oil because if the price of oil had continued to stay at 100 108 110 dollars per barrel all the calculations of uh, arun jetli in the last year's budget would have gone for a toss uh the other point that i want to add here is that uh, you know this is again people, something which people are not talking about enough that since january the price of oil has gone up by around 50% mm-hmm. and we need to kind of start asking whether modi's luck on oil is running out mm-hmm. uh now as far as the negatives are concerned uh, i mean i i have listed out a lot of points and i'll kind of take them one by one uh 
the first point I wanted to talk about was that you know all through uh, you know last uh, year, I mean last financial year, Arun Jaitley and you know the Ministry of Finance tried telling us that economic growth is not happening because RBI is not cutting interest rates, now, which was a very very fanciful and uh, you know notion to have because uh, you know if interest rates come down, I mean as I've pointed out uh, often in my columns. Uh, interest rates coming down do not lead to the EMIs coming down dramatically. I mean, in case of uh, uh, loans on consumer durables, two wheelers, and even car loans, the amount of fall in EMI is hardly anything to kind of push a person to go and you know take on a loan. And when it comes to taking on a home loan, it's it's hardly a question of interest rates anymore because prices are so high. So trying to you know tell us over and over again that you know we are trying our best but RBI is not cooperating. I mean I thought that shouldn't have happened at all. And the second point again concerns uh, Arun Jaitley, and uh, you know and and the handling of tax issues. So when the government came to power, one of the things that they promised uh, was that there would be no tax terrorism. But if you look at the recent controversy around MAT, that doesn't seem to be the case. And in a way, the government is, you know, hurting itself because it has a huge disinvestment target this year of 69,500 crores. And, you know, if the, the stock market kind of keeps falling or doesn't do as well as it did last year, the government will have, a, you know, a very tough time trying to raise that money. It might still end up raising that money by pushing LIC to pick up, uh, you know, stakes in the companies that it is disinvesting but that isn't really real disinvestment because you're essentially moving money from one arm of the government to another arm yeah. and this kind of brings me to the, my next point and you know again concerning Arun Jaitley you know Arun Jaitley and the Ministry of Finance pushed LIC to kind of uh, pick up stakes uh, in uh, public sector companies in the last financial year now this is something that Arun uh, uh, P. Chidambaram used to specialize in and uh, you know we need to kind of understand the fact that the money that is with LIC is not the money of the government. It is you know the hard-earned savings of millions of Indians, and that should be you know respected a little more than it is being currently respected. And the fourth point I wanted to make uh, is about subsidies, and uh, you know there is a very interesting chapter in this year's economic survey on on subsidies, and in in that the uh, chief economic advisor to the Ministry of Finance, Arvind Subramaniam, estimates that the uh, total subsidies offered by the Indian government come to around three lakh seventy seven thousand six hundred few crores, and uh, this works out to around four point two four percent of the GDP. Now, obviously, uh, you know the irony is, or obviously the trouble is that most of these subsidies don't reach the people they are intended for. Mm -hmm. So let's take the example of uh, the entire minimum support price system that is in place. Now the government declares min a minimum support price for 24 crops but it basically buys only two rice and wheat and only less than 6% of the farmers uh, basically benefit from this mm -hmm. and these farmers are concentrated in few states. Now the problem is that almost 46-47% of the grain that is bought through this route gets diverted into the open market and it doesn't reach the people it is intended for. So why are we doing this? So you know the, the government had set up a committee which uh, known as the Shanta Kumar committee and the report has suggestions uh, on, on this front on how to go about eliminating wasteful expenditure but nothing seems to have uh, happened on this front. So this is something I I was uh, you know I was hopeful on this front but nothing you know seems to have come out. Then you know another issue which I've been writing about a lot of late is black money. I simply don't understand this entire focus on trying to get black money back from you know uh, black money which has left the Indian shores back. Uh, so you know what we what we are told I mean the, what the propaganda machinery keeps telling us is that. Uh, all this money is in Switzerland and we are talking to Switzerland and we will get the money back. But the point that we need to understand is that the Swiss Central Bank has already put out data which shows that the amount of money held by Indians in Swiss banks has come down dramatically over the years. Mm -hmm. And the money that is still there, I mean, we don't know whether it's illegal or not. It might be illegal for all, it might be legal for all we know. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be taken into account. The other point is that there are around 70 tax havens all over the world. So the money could be absolutely anywhere. 
Now, the, the, the counterpoint I'm offered on this is that if America can do it, why can't we? Uh, so what happened was in 2010, America passed this act known as FATCA. So if you know, if you kind of use, if you were to use Mumbai or Hindi, it would be FATKA. <laughs> but uh, so, so that the act was passed in 2010, and the recent uh, Foreign Black Money Act, which was passed last week, was essentially inspired by uh, the American Act. And uh, so, obviously, the question is, you know, we, you know, people ask, is uh, you know, if Americans can do it, why can't we? But what we need to look at is that what kind of money are are the Americans recovering from that act? And their estimate is that during the first 10 years of the act, they hope to recover around $8 billion, okay, which is around, you know, an average of $800 million per year for an economy the size of $16 trillion. I mean, it is not even peanuts. Mm -hmm. And if you even compare it with the kind of money that leaves American shores every year, it's somewhere around $40 billion. So it's around 2%. So if Americans are not able to recover you know their black money what are we talking about and you know ultimately all black money is domestic mm -hmm. right i mean it it essentially we generate black money when we don't pay tax so the the focus has to be on trying to get more people to pay taxes instead of trying to chase you know money that has already left uh, yeah. the shores of this country so that's something that uh, i really didn't like then there is something that, you know, uh, Arun Shari kind of spoke about in a recent interview and I kind of agree with him completely on this front that there is too much centralization of power in this government. And this obviously comes from the fact that Narendra Modi had great success, uh, you know, running uh, a sort of a centralized government in Gujarat. But what we need to understand is that India is not Gujarat and India is too big a country to be run just out of one office. And the other point here is that, uh, which also a lot of people don't realize, is that the quality of a bureaucrats has come down dramatically over the years. You know, 30, 40 years back, even 20 years back, the best people went into bureaucracy. You know, getting into IAS used to be a huge dream for people, which it isn't anymore. So you have to take that into account when you centralize power. You also have to take into account the fact that, you know, a major reason why gov governance in this country has collapsed is because our institutions have collapsed. So something has to be done on that front as well, and which won't happen if there is centralization of power. Uh, the next point I wanted to make, again, this is a point, it's not a bad point as such, but this is a problem I think the government will face in the time to come. You know, all propaganda that happens, it tends to be simplistic in nature. And that is why it strikes a chord with, uh, you know, people. Mm -hmm. So the entire uh, propaganda to get Modi elected, Achche Din Aane Wale Hain, Ham Modi Ji Ko Lane Wale Hain, was very, very simplistic. And I think that has now started to hurt the government. Because uh, anytime, you know, something negative happens, people ask, you know, Ki bhai, Achche Din Kaha Hain, where are the good days? Mm -hmm. So recently, you know, I was on the social media and a lot of, you know, if, if you, uh, 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 you know, uh, realize uh, the pr uh, prices of uh, oil, sorry, prices of petrol and diesel in the last 20 days have been raised by a huge amount. So a lot of people are asking, you know, Ki bhai achche din kaha hai? Mm -hmm. then you look at uh, all the rains that have happened in North India, the unseasonal rains, and there people are asking, you know, where are the good days? So this propaganda, which, you know, kind of got Modi into power, will hurt him in the days to come. A uh, couple of small points and then we'll kind of close. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing that I don't like about this government is that it gets tends to get caught in too many unimportant issues. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, recently a warning was issued to two uh, district magistrates yeah. in Chhattisgarh for not wearing a bandgala <laughs> while uh, meeting the prime minister. I mean, there was some 1968 uh, rule which kind of asks for all district magistrates to wear a bandgala while meeting a prime minister now, which is very, very stupid. You can't wear a bandgala in 40 degree heat yeah. and who wears a bangala these days anyway I mean unless you're getting married so so, uh, so you know again so if you look follow the social media and even the normal media there was a lot of you know the news made it to you know the front page of Times of India I mean yeah. why so why do these things so so I'm not saying you know Modi is personally doing it but yeah. you know obviously there is someone in, in, you know somewhere who issued orders to these guys or rather you know who, who issued uh, questions to these guys as to why were you not wearing a bangal. 
then uh, you know uh, uh, the, the one of the favorite uh, talking points of the government is the janadhan yojana where they say that 15 crore bank accounts uh, have been opened which is almost saturation coverage which is pretty good but what they don't talk about is the fact that 70% of these accounts are dormant i mean this is government data mm-hmm. and uh, also the fact that you know the schemes that are being launched through the Jan- janadhan yojana i mean you have accident insurance and personal insurance and so on and so forth are they viable at the price at which they are being offered and if they are not who picks up the loss mm-hmm. because uh, you know these are 15 crore bank accounts is a huge number so why why you know we all you know bad for financial inclusiveness but what happens to the cost attached to it as well i think uh, you know that is uh, all that i wanted to say and to conclude you know i just make one broad point because you know we kind of live in an era of instant uh, judgment and instant analysis i think you know broadly uh, in comparison to uh, the manmohan singh government this government is obviously more active i mean there is there are no two ways about it but given the expectations that had been built i don't think uh, enough has been done i mean i think uh, the modi government has fallen short of the expectations that it had built into uh, the people of this country thank thanks vivek i think there was a you know a, a very nice uh, you know wrap up if you will of what the modi government uh, has done or not done or not done well uh, you mentioned at one point about man ki baat and it reminded me of what ram jethmalani said late last year uh, he was asked a question about modi at the times lit fest in bombay and uh, he gave a pretty interesting re- response and i remember that and he said that modi is a great teacher he is going to literally educate you and sell you the idea in terms of not the marketing pitch in terms of why he is doing what he is doing and he believes that's going to make a big change in the country and you're already referring to what he's doing on man ki baat anyways uh so you know uh i i noticed you did not touch upon ghar wapsi at all is there something that no, irritates I, you so much no, no, just, no, no, yeah, no. i mean yeah. see i think the thing is you know what typically what tends to i mean as i said you know there are too many unimportant issues yeah. that get uh, yeah. and i basically you know uh, i just thought that we'll talk about the economic part of it yeah Yeah. because the political part of it will need another 2 3 hours yeah so. and it makes sense and makes a lot of sense and unfortunately what is happening is that uh, from a mainstream perspective the economic agenda is getting pushed back because all this ghar wapsi and all this nonsense is you know grabbing all the headlines unfortunately yeah. anyways so okay so moving ahead let's take some questions uh, you know i i've selected a few from the long list that had come in uh, let's start with you know uh, the simple one which is sure. what are the three biggest achievements and three biggest failures of modi's one year tenure as i said i mean i mean uh, the three biggest achievements i would say are basically you know uh, uh, no corruption at the top bringing down inflation mm-hmm. and uh, and i mean the third one could be any one of yeah. the things that i talked which about which is the, which means basically there's no big third one <laughs> i honey but that doesn't matter i mean yeah. there can yeah. be multiple achievements uh, mm-hmm. which you know are good enough good okay mm-hmm. so it uh-huh. uh the three uh, big the worst ones i would say one is uh, you know very little action on the subsidies front yeah. i mean a lot of money gets wasted then uh, i would say you know too much uh, talk on uh, getting black money back from abroad yep, i mean yep. we have enough black money in the country mm-hmm. i mean why are we not talking about cleaning up political funding in this country yep. why are we not talking about uh, you know breaking down uh, the nexus between black money and real estate mm-hmm. and uh, so you know we're not talking about that at all and the third thing i would say is uh, you know basically uh i mean i don't know whether it's important you know but i i would say this is the third point where you know the entire uh, the surprises that are sprung up by the ministry of uh, finance mm-hmm. that shouldn't uh, happen i mean you can't have uh, you know you can't suddenly change your tax policy you know you get up one day and one bureaucrat mm-hmm. has an idea and then you know you say now okay now all the fias have to pay tax going yeah. back from such and such Mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that clarity has to yeah. be there i think the one thing uh, the listeners won't miss is that when you listed out your not so great uh, takeaways for the modi government uh, you know arun jaitley was right on the top on several of them and ha, but the, uh, i mean so that was more of uh, yeah, yeah. My, uh, but, that, uh, but that leads me to a question which mm-hmm. is that when modi came to power i think jaitley said they could announce a long term economic policy 
Ha, so there is no. I mean, as Arun Shore, I mean Arun Shore also said this in his interview that there is no, you know, a, there is no broad vision, vision governing yeah. this government. But I mean, you know, as long as they do the right things, I mean, they do the small things right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, whether we need a vision, I yeah. really don't. And whether a country like a country as diverse as complex as India can have a vision, I mean, we can have a vision. You know, we need to be at such and such place by 2020 yeah. or whatever. But that doesn't really mean anything. So yeah, it's one of the questions actually, which one of our readers asked, mm. is uh, is Modi following some grand master plan? Uh, it um, doesn't look like. Yeah. I mean, it, if it is, is if he's following a master plan, I mean, then it is only in his head. At least, uh, it's not out there for you and me to figure out. Mm-hmm. It's it's a well kept secret, apparently. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let, let's move ahead. Uh, so, one of the questions that's come in is, uh, how do you interpret the inability of the Modi government to get the crucial bills passed by the Rajya Sabha? Huh. And will it compel the electorate mm-hmm. to ensure that the change of governments in the states mm-hmm. and give strength to the numbers of the ruling party in the Rajya Sabha? It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, that will need another two hours. So mm-hmm. I'll try and uh, see. Basically, uh, you know, the lack of cooperation in the Rajya Sabha also comes from the fact, uh, you know, as to how BJP behaved during the years it was in opposition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can't take. Uh, that way you know an opposition will behave like an opposition yeah. an opposition is not meant to cooperate with the government that's one part the second part is that you know a lot of people have been talking about as to how by 2017 uh, you know uh, bjp and nda will have majority or if not a majority they'll have you know a sufficient number of people in the rajya sabha uh, the trouble there is that by 2017 2018 in the 2019 elections will be on the radar and yeah. once you know elections are on the radar then you know economic reforms are really not uh, top of the agenda for any government mm-hmm. so and the third the, the as per you know whether voter will give majority to uh, you know the modi government in the rajya sabha i really don't mean i don't think voters think like that i mean voters will basically vote you know looking at their own uh, yeah. local yeah. issues their Uh, cost uh, calculations and so on and so forth. Yeah. I don't know. So, so it. basically, if was uh, if one was to stretch what you're saying, is that uh, this problem is going to continue for quite some time? Uh, the Rajya Sabha thing. Yeah. Yes. So that's not great news for anyone who's. Ha! But see, there are ways of getting around. I mean, yeah. the the thing is, they did manage to get the black money legislation through Rajya Sabha. Mm-hmm. There are uh, I mean, insurance the, also. I think they managed. The insurance they yeah. uh, they managed. Land acquisition bill is stuck because obviously it's now on uh, Rahul Gandhi's radar. Yeah. So I don't see that uh, getting passed. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, you know, the way to handle it would be to get the BJP the the uh, states in which BJP has a government. the land acquisition bills can be passed Pass there as, as well because land is a state, state subject, subject as well at mm-hmm. the end of the day so mm-hmm. it's like a concurrent subject that both can yeah. okay yeah okay so so for all the listeners over there you know dig in for the next couple of years is going to be tough uh now of course this is something top of mind for everyone what is your view on modi's multiple foreign visits will india gain anything from that or is it only to satisfy modi's ambition to become a world leader see i'll be honest i don't understand uh, you know diplomacy well enough to be passing uh, far reaching judgment on it mm-hmm. but uh, i mean it's too there are too many people talking about it without really understanding the nuances mm-hmm. uh, that go into it so what i'll do is i'll essentially you know uh, go back to arun shore's interview and one of the things that he was happy about was the fact that uh, you know one of the things he was happy about was on the diplomatic front and his view was that india has gained mm-hmm. on the diplomatic front uh, since modi has come to power but mm-hmm. i really don't have a personal opinion on this because i don't understand it well enough okay uh, the uh, the other question is do you think the groundwork done what modi has done in the first year apparently some groundwork uh, will start delivering dividends in good measure from hy2 Second half of 2016, H-Y- leading to a GDP growth of 8 percent plus. H Y two would be mean uh, second half, so yeah, which October means onwards. post post yeah. October. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's a very it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, see, one thing that is not happening, you know, one thing that happened in the last five six years is because of high inflation. is the fact that people uh, stopped consuming. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the consumption. Like, 
uh, expenditure kind of i mean it 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 may not have fallen but it was not growing as much as it it was it had fallen also in fact if you look mm-hmm. at the iip numbers so and if that turnaround happens i mean mm-hmm. i mean if you look at april car sales they were the best in yeah. 30 months mm-hmm. and car sales is a reasonably good indicator because it's a real number it is not a theoretical construct like you know the index of industrial production mm-hmm. or the gdp so there has been some recovery on that front the other thing that needs to uh, happen is again you know i i am a great believer in the fact that if the real estate sector in this country can be revived mm. we will see tremendous economic growth because real estate has a lot of multipliers okay mm-hmm. uh, basically uh, not a lot of multipliers what i wanted to say is that it has uh, you know uh, there are 270 industries which benefit from real estate okay i mean this uh-huh. is a number that was given to me a professor of economics at iim bangalore mm-hmm. and so if if you can get re- revive the real estate sector the multiplier effect that uh, it will have will be tremendous but that will only happen if prices start to come down and if there are homes uh, you know which are built at a price which yeah, yeah, which yeah. people can buy yeah yeah so i don't see uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean second half of 2015 16 is too quick yeah uh, it's mm-hmm. too, too quick mm-hmm. yeah So you know the sense I'm getting, and you know, ideally, one if we go back exactly one year, and if we were to try and vision what we'd be discussing one year from then, which is now, uh, you know, we would have thought there'd be a lot of excitement, there'd be policy uh, reforms, there'd be progress, there'd be you know, people would be excited, and uh, if you think about the last thirty, forty minutes of the discussion we've had, it's all. like you know modi is done pretty mediocre at the at best see it's and not see the, the, again i mean you what happens is mediocre vis-a-vis what so he's he's, yeah. he's he's been mediocre yes in comparison to the expectations he had set that's right but yeah. if you compare it uh, with the manmohan singh government which is not always the best comparison to make yeah. uh, he's done reasonably well yeah yes and it see it also exposes you know which is something we don't realize you know when you get caught up in the marketing and the branding situation what we don't realize is that the the governance in this country has totally collapsed Perhaps. i mean and modi cannot modi's branding and modi's marketing cannot Can't set that, that right yeah, yeah. you know you have to have institutions need to be this like 50 years 50 yeah, years I mean, of momentum your, over yeah, there your courts need to deliver justice yeah. on time i mean there are so many things which we can uh, i mean i'll give you a very simple example i mean this is something i was discussing with my chartered accountant the other day and i had gone to meet her and she suddenly sprung a surprise that you know along with the service tax number you also need a professional tax number i said okay so let's apply for it now being a self employed professional and apparently if you kind of go beyond a certain income mm-hmm. you need a, a tds number or something like that mm-hmm. i mean i don't remember the exact term she used mm-hmm. so you need a so you have a pan you have a service tax number you have a professional tax number and you have a tds number so you have four numbers mm-hmm. now why do we need four numbers okay so i asked her ki bhai you know pan is a primary key it's a unique number why can't i use my pan to pay my service tax to pay my professional tax and also to file my mm-hmm. tds mm-hmm. so the answer was very very interesting the answer was that all these taxes are dealt by different departments mm-hmm. so you have the pan is uh, or oh, sorry your income tax is obviously the income tax department service tax is dealt by the excise department and the professional tax is dealt by the sales tax department so since there are three departments there are three numbers no you know when you talk about simplifying tax and everything this is what you should be simplifying now, why do i need three numbers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i can do with i can make do with one number you have my pan number right you have my date you have my date of birth you have my uh, you know you have my father's name you have my name you have these days you have my email id you have my phone yeah, number you have yeah. my bank uh, account number you have my micr so why do you need a service tax number I mean, yeah. if you're talking about simplifying things, this is what should be simplified. Yeah. But you know, everybody is working from the back end. Nobody is working from the point of view of the guy who's yeah. paying these taxes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess net net, and I completely agree with you that expectations are so high that Modi really has to, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat to make this work for him. Uh, but I want to now spend a few minutes just focusing on two aspects, and the first, the reason why we're doing this, uh, and I'm, you know, I don't know how comfortable you'll be discussing this, but. you've been in the media for long right and we the reason we exist as an equity master is because we realized that the investor doesn't really get the absolute truth in the message that goes out what's your take on the kind of 
uh, discussions, the information that is being given out on media channels. Is it becoming better? Is it becoming worse? Should readers trust it? I know I'm hmm. asking you to make a generic statement, but uh-huh. is there a general lack of credibility on what is happening these days uh, in the media? See, I think people at times uh, read too much into it. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you can trust the media completely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm somewhere in, in between. I mean, I'm not... Uh, Mm-hmm. Also, you know, what you need to realize is the fact that there is just way too much noise out there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, on most days I am better off not watching television news. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I don't read my daily newspaper. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think most daily newspapers still do a reasonably good job of giving you what is happening in yeah. this mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, might, there, will, there might be a spin to it. Yes, but then, you know, biases are there everywhere yep. and you have to be, as a reader, a little smarter yep. to kind of mm-hmm. see through them. And uh, the, the other problem, at least with the, the business media, is that, you know, there is too much effort going into making things simplistic, not simple. Please mm-hmm. understand the difference. Mm-hmm. So, simplistic would mean, I'll, to give you an example, that, you know, let's say the RBI kind of cuts interest rates. Okay. So then the simplistic thing to kind of put out would be RBI cuts the repo rate, your home loan mm-hmm. rates will come down. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Right? It's mm-hmm. not as simple as that. So this is something which people need to understand. So mm-hmm. this again, you know, when, when the media does this, it is not, there is no agenda to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. people think there is an agenda and there's no agenda. It's mm-hmm. just that this is the most obvious story that occurs to the editor when the RBI cuts interest rates mm-hmm. and it is people focused and yeah. people friendly because you know people will get up in the morning mm-hmm. and they'll mm-hmm. say that RBI has cut interest rates the EMIs will fall mm-hmm. but it doesn't work like that so you know the answer to this is uh, you know it's very uh, I mean it's it's extremely nuanced maybe I can write a column around it yeah it which, should, which yeah, will yeah, be yeah, a yeah. you know a better way to explain yeah. this maybe you can highlight some of the typical <laughs> media responses ha, I, mean, because I have been a part of it and yeah. you know there have been days when you know we've said uh, we've written a you know story saying that okay rbi has cut rates but it will not impact the emis but then the editor has then wanted five boxes in which we can put yeah. everything and yeah. so what has happened is because of the te- because of television the the newspapers and magazines also have become more and more visual but you know uh, you have to draw the line somewhere everything cannot be fitted into boxes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know yeah, there has yeah. to be some text yeah, yeah so which is where the problem is okay so i think that that'll be helpful for the readers mm-hmm. and look forward to that issue of the daily reckoning uh, now a few minutes on the economy mm-hmm. right you've spoken a lot about the, you know the the ups and downs and all the other stuff uh, what is happening on the ground are you seeing to use a you know for for the lack of a better word a phrase uh, are you seeing green shoots are you seeing a turnaround happening uh, when do you see it if at all I don't know yeah I mean I've been thinking about it and uh, you know it would be too early to say that green shoots are mm-hmm. coming uh, you mm-hmm. know because uh, obviously you know the if you look at um, uh, the one green shoot recently was the car sales data. I mean, mm-hmm. that was pretty good. But again, you know, if you look on the flip side, exports are down mm-hmm. dramatically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So right now, it's a little iffy to kind of swing either way. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I guess if we kind of if if you know car sales data keeps improving for a while, and if some other data points also start to yeah. kind of. Okay. What do you look at when you are trying to? Uh, form an opinion do you have like uh, a few metrics that you keep very close track on to see if trends are changing not really not mm-hmm. really i mean you just generally see it's it's also a function of uh, it's i mean i i don't think there is a formula to it it's at some level also a function of the fact as to uh, uh you know how things are appearing in the media Mm-hmm. You know, the kind of news items that you're seeing, whether they are positive enough, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, even though the media keeps making things positive, uh, mm-hmm. you know, many times. But I mean, that's one thing that you look at. Then you look at uh, all these general, you know, consumption numbers. You look at lending data, mm-hmm. uh, bank lending data, which has not improved at all. I mean, it's uh, it's around 8 to 10%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, you look at that, you look at lending to specific sectors, mm-hmm. that has also not improved. So you look at this. See, I try and look at real numbers rather than theoretical constructs like uh, you know GDP and uh, 
mm-hmm. and index of industrial production and so if you look at all these real numbers you get some sense uh, of uh, what is happening and uh, the gdp number to khair i mean these days there is a there is a huge problem to it yeah. i mean mm-hmm. you know it's very difficult to believe that india is growing at 7 to 8% i mean you can't see it on the ground except mm-hmm. uh, if you are in the e-commerce sector of course mm-hmm. and and uh, the fact that you give the perspective that you do uh, means a lot to uh, you know what uh, tanushri at equity master has been working on for the last several months which is identifying the mega trends on uh, which are very uh, inherent and which are very systemic and uh, the, the 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 role the policy makers play is either they catalyze it or they don't but the trends are pretty much irreversible trends which have got to do with uh, demographic changes which are something very integral uh, to the uh, you know to the country so uh, you know i, I was wondering whether uh, uh, tanushri you had a question for vivek given his uh, view on the economy and if if you wanted to ask him something yeah, uh, one thing that uh, i definitely would want to know from you is as to what's your assessment of the new avatar of the planning commission the niti aayog and uh, do you think that will have an impact which will be uh real and or it's continue to stay on paper planning uh, on paper honestly i haven't you know heard enough from th- them till date to form an opinion uh i mean i really don't have an answer because uh, i mean t- uh, as of now you haven't seen them do much i mean maybe yeah. they will in the days to come i mean it is not even clear as to what they are expected to yeah. do hey, that's a big gamble uh-huh. what is taking because yeah. if i mean are they expected to advise the the prime minister and the government then of course that may may be happening we don't know are they expected to kind of make five year plans like the planning commission used to do so i don't know i mean i don't have an answer for that so you know my 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 take on that is is one of the biggest gambles which modi has you know uh, undertaken and it's sort of reflective of what he likes to work in right it's like centralization of power a few people calling the shots and doing the uh, stuff no in a way yeah. not because see if yeah. you look at the erstwhile planning commission that was also a centralization of power yeah. because you know the chief ministers used to elected chief ministers had to go so, yeah. to mm-hmm. the planning commission to ask for funds and yeah. they probably had independent uh, I mean, opinion, so that doesn't yeah. i mean so it works both ways so it's not yeah. like it was yeah. so, so we will we will i mean you know i mean what the niti ayog is supposed to do i guess will become uh, clear in the months to come and uh, i mean the only thing that you know it what comes out in the media are the speeches that arvind panagaria yeah. has been making i mean beyond that one hasn't seen i mean i don't have access to the government so i also only read the papers and yeah. you know figure out as to what is happening yeah. so so net net you're leaving us with the thought that it's a, it's a, it's a mixed bag and people yeah. it's a mixed bag obviously mixed bag, yeah. yes i mean no doubt and uh, if you were to look into your crystal ball and guess what will happen in the next 3 4 5 years I'm basically you know I'm a very pessimistic person by my nature so I normally you know I can't see good things coming till after they have well happened after they have well happened <laughs> so I am I, I, in in the last 7 8 yeah. years that has worked well yeah because that you know every time you've seen okay something is yeah. about to happen and, yeah. something else happens yeah so I really don't know but on the ground at least the numbers don't suggest anything which except for one month of car sales data which yeah. can which be again ab- is only one which month can yeah. be an aberration also yeah, yeah. So, but which is interesting and, but yeah. you know the, the thing is yeah. uh, you know the april uh, so basically rbi releases uh, credit data month late mm-hmm. so uh, you know we will come to know the april end data uh, in no may end in may, may end may or end first end. week of june yeah. whenever yeah. they choose to release it mm-hmm. so that should give us some sort of hint Okay, whether, uh, huh, because you know the moment lending starts improving, you know, you know either consumption is happening or projects are getting back, so all that, uh, and you know as far as the projects which are stuck, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, I mean the last uh, mention of that was in the economic survey, mm-hmm. and I didn't see any improvement on that front. I mean those projects continue to remain stuck. Okay. Stuck. Yeah. Okay. So you know we'll we'll wrap up the discussion on the economy side and continue with Tanushree. So. Vivek thank you very much for doing this uh, first ever master series with us thanks and uh, you know and all of us are you know we have a much better perspective of what modi has done not done not done well and hopefully 
hopefully, and maybe for the sake of the country, next year when we do this with you or two years, yeah. hopefully he would have done something to make the Achyadin more real than what they are right now. Yes. Great. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, let's see. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much.